Nothing happens that side of the screen okay. anyway. Well, nothing happens. Like nothing happens at all. all really. <laughs> you're just blagging it. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a kind of quick show of hands, just to, so I kind of know who's in the audience. So, who's used Commerce One by X? Pretty much all of you. Who used Ubercut before that? Okay. So, pretty experienced Commerce guys. Um, so I, I'm Scott. I used to be a. I used to work for Commerce Guys. Um, maybe I don't know, about a year ago now. No, two years. I was two years. Yeah, yeah. Two, 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 two years. Two years. Um, yeah. Then I left, and I'm now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm now one of the senior developers at Test Global. We do pretty much anything to do with education. We're also publishers of the World University Ranking. Um, we're quite heavy users of Google Commerce quite recently. Unfortunately, we're still using One.x, but I'm kind of standing on the great computer.x. And what I want to take you through now is kind of the site builder's approach to Drupal Commerce 2.x. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you would agree that the site builder's approach to One.x was just install a module for this, install a module for that, install a module for this. And quickly you end up with quite a whole dependency tree, but also just tons of modules that are offering kind of really bespoke bits of functionality that you would expect to be in core. And I'm going to show you now how some of that is in Drupal core. Um, so just first slide. Uh, I was um, drinking some beers with my friends yesterday and telling them I'm doing this Drupal talk and they were like, what is Drupal? So they urban dictionaried it and I thought these were quite funny kind of definitions about Drupal and it kind of sums up the kind of Drupal Commerce 1.x approach of um, notably being open source and nothing else, uh, designed to be totally useless right after installation. So you, do, <laughs> <laughs> you, you install Drupal Commerce 1.x and there's not really much you can do. Like out of the box you get, you get kind of a score but not really not really anything you'd want to put in front of a, a customer. Um, and perhaps that's the same as Drupal with a human heart soul, but it's probably a different argument. Um, so yeah, yeah, so I thought that was pretty spot on. These were the only two that were safe to display. I wouldn't <laughs> look yourself at some of the other definitions because they have nothing to do with Drupal, but apparently people use the word Drupal for all sorts of things. <laughs> um, so yeah, so in the Wonder X world, you install commerce and you have a score, but you don't really. You kind of have to install all of these modules for things like car exploration. Um, what else have I got here? This is actually a live site, so all of these are installed to just sell a magazine. Like we're, we're installing check out extra login page to sell a magazine. Like this is stuff that you'd expect a modern commerce solution to, to have. Um, and again, this is probably even better displayed with this slide. So these are the most popular commerce modules as of January 2017, as of this year. And it's, we've also put the port status. So you see a, a lot of these now say in core, in core, in core. So all of these modules that pretty much, well, uh, yeah, all, of, all around 50,000 co active commerce sites would have to install. Most of these are now in core. So like, we're coming, well, I say we, Matt and Commerce guys are coming a long way. I just use the stuff now. Um, so that, that's kind of the contrib space, but also everyone pretty much has also a lot of custom code to achieve, again, really basic stuff that you'd want to see in the core of the project. So um, one of the most popular things that's now in uh, Commerce 2.x is uh, varied checkout flows. So uh, in Matt's presentation that he just did, he talked about how if you're selling a digital product, or if you're selling a physical product, you want to capture different fields. In Commerce 1, you only had the one checkout flow unless you installed a series of content modules, um, various different bits of hackery, or some custom code where you are setting checkout panes and then unsetting them if you have this access and all sorts of horrible stuff that you don't really want to be writing. Don't look at my code. Either. <laughs> Skip that. I just committed that straight into NASA. I didn't PR that one. Yeah, it, didn't uh, yeah, <laughs> um, and again, uh, this is a live commerce site. Uh, this is a checkout step at the start. Um, most of the time, you want to capture some information about your customer. 
And in Commerce 1, you have to install Commerce Expert login step or a variety of different modules just to do that. But it's okay, because there is the future. See, I had, I had almost <laughs> like a wait for gasp. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, it begs the question, how far can we go out of the box without installing any contrib modules with Commerce 2.x? Hopefully I will now show you. Um, so, this presentation is kind of aimed at site builders. What I want to show is, I'm going to show a lot of forms and I'm going to describe the kind of concepts and entities that build Commerce 2.x. And if you have any questions, I'm just going to refer you to Matt. So, i kind of crack on. Um, the first thing when you come to installing commerce is we have this notion of a store entity. Um, what we didn't have, what we, what, what we had when we installed commerce one was everything was sold from this one location. Um, if you had uh, an office in Nottingham that was shipping out your digital products and a, an office in London that was selling your magazine or whatever, you, you, you couldn't really model that very well. Uh, what we have in commerce too is this notion of stores. So as once you install commerce, you have to configure a, a store. If you have multiple stores, you can configure more than one. Um, you can select which countries and which currencies that this store belongs to, which lends itself right, really nicely to either the marketplace model, if you have lots of consumers selling different products, or if you have lots of different stores that you want to um, only focus on one currency, for example, or if your requirements from different countries are really specific. So, for example, one use case that we had was um, payment gateways charge varying amounts on international orders compared to UK orders. Um, so if you want to use a different payment gateway per store, that is possible. Not, Not yet. yet. Almost. Will be. Will be possible. Um, very soon. Um, so if I have PayPal as a payment gateway, gateway that charges me 4% on international orders, um, but also 4% on UK orders. I can have a different store and use Strike in the UK, which charges me not that. Um, so quite simply, commerce stores have one, current, uh, one currency, one store. So it models the multi-currency model a lot nicer. And it's kind of a good overview of the architecture. So you have your stores, your products, and your orders. So, once we've set up the store, which I will try and show now, this is going to be hard when it's not mirrored. I'll do less mirroring. Yeah. Moment. Are we good? Can you see that? Yep. Cool. So, in here, I have stores. I have one store I set up already called Swiper. Um, don't ask why. <laughs> I can add a new one and call this uh, Scott's Demo Store. And here we select the default currency. Oh, here we select the default currency for the store. But I've only got one currency enabled. Um, so before we set up currency, before we set up a store for a new currency, we have to import a new currency. Um, one of the nice things about commerce is it lets us um, add new currencies if we wanted to. You may ask how I can't make up a currency, why would I want to do that? And there's a couple of use cases. A, Matt referred to one called Bitcoin. Like we, uh, the currency data set that we use doesn't have Bitcoin in it. But there's also another one where one of the clients I had a commerce site, Vivian Westwood, they used to sell products in Australia and New Zealand, both in Aussie dollars, but at a slightly different rate. So they had New Zealand Aussie dollars and Aussie dollars. So uh, it is a justified use case to make up a currency. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. What about if you want to uh, announce your Suffolk? Uh, Suffolk? Uh, Suffolk? Uh, Suffolk? 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 Yeah, so yeah. You, the euro symbol in France appears on the right hand side, and in the UK we expect it to be on the left. That's all kind of baked into the data set. I guess you could override it with the formatter and probably, probably. 
with that dimension. So you can't do it in the UI, but you're probably... I, I won't go for that. I just wanted to make a Brexit joke because it's quite funny. Um, but yeah, so I, I can import all manner of currencies. Probably, yeah. Um, and then the store that I was trying to create earlier. What's that? I don't know if this is that bad. Ah, Docker. <laughs> Future. Um, <laughs> so one, once I've... I'm not going to go... I can just show this one I made earlier. Um, I can select... Uh, which currency this uses somewhere here. Um, so once I've imported the currencies, I can create a store that is backed by that currency. Back to slides. Um, so we have a store, and presumably now you want to sell some products. And this is quite a, uh, this is actually directly from the commerce2.x documentation. Um, so it's pretty much the presentation, it's just me reading the doc. Um, <coughs> This is quite a common use case, and you quickly end up with a kind of a lot of products and a lot of different SKUs. So large, medium, small T-shirts, but then you have large blue T-shirt, large red T-shirt, and like, how do you model that? Um, that model, pretty much the same in Commerce One as it into Commerce Two X. I don't think there's a better way of doing it, so it's the same. But I'll quickly um, show you here. Too many windows. So I have product attributes, and here's. Um, I kind of wanted to do a bit of a demo that wasn't just your T-shirts there. So this is a the case of a digital product where I'd have attributes that are plans. So you might want to have a yearly plan, a quarterly plan, a monthly plan that has various different bill rates or um, prices. Um, so I have my product attributes here. Um, and the element type, which kind of Matt talked about in his presentation earlier, um, this is now in core, where in commerce1.x it was really difficult without installing the country module um, to have your product attribute list rendered nicely. So no one really wants to go into a commerce checkout, buy a t-shirt and have to select red, blue, green. You'd like to see the product. So what you can do, because the product attributes are fieldable, you can attach an image to it, have uh, a red, green, blue t-shirt, and actually be able to click it. It's a lot nicer. So let me quickly show you on the slides. Um, you can have it end up like this. So it's a lot nicer when you can actually visualize the product rather than um, just see a, a drop down or select list. So once I've configured my product attribute, Then configure my product variations. And I already have one of those set up. Again, these are fieldable. So on my product variations, I have um, a description. So I mean, t-shirts are pretty self-explanatory. If you change to a red t-shirt, you expect the description to change to this is a red t-shirt, this is a blue t-shirt. So um, you might want to add some more information. So um, in the case of the kind of plan, my description would change varying on plan, so under quarterly I would say that you get 25% off if you buy yearly, and I can upsell them or I can change that description to whatever I want. Um, this is an important step on the actual product um, itself. So if I flip back to my variation type. Yeah, here. Um, why is that required? Because you have data. You can't remove it if it has data. I, sure. um, so on the product attribute itself, uh, on the product variation itself, I can pick which attributes I want that to display. Um, so if you have attributes that are shared between different variation types, that's model possible. Like <coughs> if I'm, what would model that quite well? Why, what would you share variation, what would you share attribute? attributes would you share with different variations? Anything, yeah? Anything. 
different size. Yeah, so if you had um, small, medium, large, um, you would share that across most of your catalogs. You wouldn't recreate small, medium, large for each of your variations. Like. Um, so that, yeah, so once you've set up your variations and the attributes, you then uh, in a nice place where you can actually add a product. So here I have um, my swiper subscription. Um, and you can see here I can select on that which variations I want it to support. Um, so I have all of them on the screen. And now if I view this product, I end up with a nice uh, cart form. So I've um, configured a store in current view, and now I've configured a product. Um, I get the quantity field, I get the variation selector, I get the subscription, and all of this. Um, one of the notable differences between this and commerce1.x is this whole idea of product displays. A lot of people have found this quite confusing to explain to clients and uh, to clients, of this idea of you have a, uh, <coughs> a product and a product display. Does, like, did people find this confusing as a model? Yeah. Yeah. Made my life really tough. Yeah, so um, in, in uh, CP7 then, we had this idea of a node type that was a product display because it had a entity reference field or a product reference field um, onto a product. How you had to build up your catalog, whereas in uh, Commerce 2, all of this belongs on the product. And using things like Twig and all of the stuff that we get in Drupal 8, we can build, uh, theme it however we want. You wouldn't theme it like this, but this is just um, the seven theme. Um, so I can add that to cart. And as you see, I've got products in a cart. Payment gateway. So now I've. Just ask, attributes where you've got no stock of a certain size of product, does that mean you can add? So stock is the imported, but. Um, but it, do you have to change attributes or what? How no. does it get you can not represented? Sure you um, yeah, so you, you would, because the way the model works, um, you'd have a different skew for each of these. A red, blue, uh, sorry, a large red T-shirt would have a different skew. Your stock would be against the skew item. So if you change your selector form to that skew, it would be out of stock, and we could we'd display an out of stock there. Um, so, yeah, um, remember this screen from, you probably do remember it because you're probably still working with your commerce one day, so, but payment gateways are all powered by rules in some weird concoction of rules that split off slightly, and it got really messy and horrible. Um, in Commerce1.x, because we have different order types, and we can have different checkout flows and different stores, we can have a payment gateway attached to those without having to edit this payment gateway, add a rules condition that says something like, if the SKU has this in it, use this payment gateway, or if the currency is this, use this payment gateway, we can model all that without having to edit the actual payment gateway definition itself. We can have that at a per store level or a cloud order type level. Amazing. He likes it. Amazing. Why, 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 why? So um, one of the, 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 the my, one of the ways we use this at TED is um, if you are an existing customer, you probably already have a payment method associated. So we display a different uh, payment method. So use your existing card. Um, that becomes a lot easier in Commerce 2 X. So that's it. Yeah. So um, I recently ported. Bug me. I ported it. Um, the Stripe payment gateway is probably my only contribution to Commerce2.x. I, I think, it, well, maybe I had like two commits in documentation, probably. Um, so I, I ported the Stripe payment gateway. If you're if you're a module developer and you want to port a payment gateway now, um, we used to quote at Commerce Guys to clients like Amex or Grange or whatever that it was around 20 to 15, 20 days of development. 
um, to build a payment gateway, is that we sit down support um, using Boyan's brilliant payment API. So it's a lot easier, and it's actually really simple. Um, depends on the payment gateway. So Stripe, Braintree, they all use this kind of JavaScript tokenization method. Um, that's really easy. Uh, providing their API, uh, API documentation is really good. Um, I didn't actually refer to the original Commerce Stripe module when I was porting it. I was just referring to uh, Boyan's work around Braintree. Um, yeah, probably. He says with confidence. It's easy. So yeah, so the whole ca for capture and iframe is that each uh, the pay PayPal PayPal uses the other flow that isn't the same one as Braintree and Stripe. Pa the PayPal flow of the payment gateway. Yes, the offsite. Yeah, yes, the offsite redirect. That's in the payment gateway to model that. So the way, what happens behind the scenes when you add a payment, you can have uh, capture an auth, or auth, or capture whichever around it is. So in that situation, you could build a, a payment gateway that was, I'm going to capture the payment, but not going to authorize it. And then later in the back end, you could say, okay, this has been received, now mark this as pay. It's similar to like a check. Um, you wouldn't. Uh, confirm that order straight away until payment's been processed. Um, so it'll be like easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's really easy to port. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be hard to port, port that. So. Um, so that. So after we've configured a payment gateway, uh, we are on to order types. So in one I made earlier, I have order types here. A commerce, when you install commerce, it comes with a default order type. Um, I wanted to create one specifically for digital products on this idea that if you're selling a digital product, you don't need to capture a shipping address. You still need to capture a billing address, and there's some funny issues around VAT depending on what country you're in. So you might need to capture a place of consumption address, um, but that can usually just be the billing address. I won't get too much into tax details because it's, it's boring. Um, so in here, I can configure which checkout flow I want my order type to use. Um, so I only have one checkout flow configured here, but in commerce to the X, as I'm really excited about, is the fact that I can have multiple checkout flows. So here is the default one that ships with commerce, and um, Matt said in his presentation before this one, there was a lot, a lot of UX effort put into analyzing Pretty much every e-commerce store under the sun. Every major retail in the United States, yeah. I went and I tried to not take the data. Yeah, so we, I say we, uh, Matt pretty much added everything to a cart, noted whether it was a one-step payment gateway, uh, a one-step checkout, multi-step, um, if they had a sidebar on the side or, or whatever, to try and find what is the best UX for, for a checkout flow. Um, Commerce Analytics has a, this whole section where you can um, analyze the your clients, I imagine, would really want to analyze this kind of data to get the poss best possible checkout flow. Um, if you get people dropping off in the review stage, then you can say, well, maybe we don't need a review stage. Maybe we just go straight to the payment process. Um, it's important to really, really look at A, what you're selling, and B, um, what, what people are actually doing on your site, because this is 
this is money, this is really tangible. If you make several tweaks here, you can increase your conversion, which is kind of what we're all about, really. Um, so with commerce2.x, I can have multiple checkout flows, and probably without too much work, I could A-B test this. Um, so if you wanted to set up checkout flow A, checkout flow B, and switch between the two, um, and, and see which one converts higher. Um, so I will add a new checkout flow. So you can create checkout flow plugins, but out of the box, you, ha you have a multi-step plugin. So here I can say, okay, I don't want the review page. Let's stick that on the page. And then I've instantly gone down to two pages instead of three. Makes the checkout a bit quicker. And it might increase conversion. Um, but this, I can also say that uh, I don't want the review page at all. This is a digital product, so I don't need to capture contact information or whatever the case may be. Like the, the possibilities are infinite. In the TED example that I showed earlier that we built on Commerce One, we have uh, two checkout flows, one for B2B customers and one for B2C. Uh, in the B2B world, we want to capture um, which agency they're from and various different other fields. And the only way we could do that in Commerce One, aside from a few contract modules, was to physically form alter the checkout flow and unset the uh, pains and fields, which is a bit messy and horrible. Commerce Two X, the future, we can have multiple checkout flows. So once I save this, on my order type, I can say, uh, use my new Scott checkout flow. So when I check this out, um, it will go down that flow, um, which I gather, Chandeep, that solves some of your problems. Good. So I've set up a new order type. I've set up a new uh, multiple checkout flow. And now I can buy my product. And if I go back to my product, I gather I'm not going to be able to buy it because I haven't got a Stripe account set up on here and I can't remember my API details. Um, yeah, so I haven't got a payment gateway set up, but if I had, I could check this out and buy several monthly subscriptions for Swiper, whatever Swipe is, I guess. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to get ported into commerce now I've got a patch waiting if Matt wants to review it anytime <laughs> soon, um, is this idea that not all of your products need a car. If I'm selling a digital subscription, I'm not going to buy four monthly subscriptions to the same thing. I probably just want to disable the car. Do I have a flag there on it? And if I save, this isn't going to... Uh, I should have thought about this before I started demoing it, because maybe this isn't going to... So if I hit add to cart now, I go to a cart. No, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Don't review that touch yet. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's pretty much <coughs> setting up stores, currencies, products, product variations, product attributes, order flows, order types, and that's all out of the box. To do that in Commerce One, <laughs> would have, I'd have just been ticking modules and then configuring them, which is pretty painful. So if you have any questions, happy to answer them, or if I can't answer them, I'll refer you to one of the maintainers of commerce who's sitting over there. Thank you. <laughs> Go, you, he was first. Um, shipping. Shipping is in beta? Beta, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, that is a country module. Um, Side note, we didn't take beta 6 yet, so if you use beta 5 with shipping, okay. it will break. Okay. Um, we have, a, we have a, a class that's missing, so once we take beta 6, it'll be rock and roll. So just use dev. Always use dev. I, I, I guess one of, one of the hard things, especially in the, in the contrib space, is deciding what should be in core and what should be the area of contrib. Um, like, my flag on the order type of take this straight to check out and skip the cart, I think should be in core but it's quite easily to just spin that up as a, a contrib module. Um, shipping, I don't know why, I can't argue for Boyan as to why he wants to have it in a separate module. There's a lot. 
it's, it's quite. A, it's, it's it's a big model. Yeah, it keeps it more nimble. Um, we can't break commerce, but we can break shipping. We're not going to make commerce three, but we could do a, a new version of shipping that just integrates. Yeah, so yeah, so shipping's in in, in business. Yeah, I, at, at Commerce Guys, when I was there, one of, a lot of our clients were all selling digital products things. No one really needed shipping. And those that did, shipping was fine. So Stripe support 3D secure? It's all it's payment gateway dependent. Yeah, no, it is. But there, there was a, a commerce chief that was discussing that he would uh, leverage the, the Stripe integration to work with the Stripe I'm not sure if it's a brand of that one. Uh, the Stripe is commerce multi like multi currency. That's not in core. Like multi currency is just you set the price per. 1.x, you can set a conversion rate. You can't do that in 2x. I have no idea. You, you can't. I have a look. You, you, yeah, that's not in core 2x. Uh, I think so. There's no. There's, I'll look into it. <laughs> you can point to the one point is you can, you can run a, a currency conversion for the Australian euro. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, we'll find out. So it, Again, it depends on the payment gateway support is completely Yeah. Um, I'm not I'm, I'm not sure of this. But I couldn't do I could do it with Uber Cards. I couldn't do it with Commerce. Um because it was for the workflow and I uh, have a word up as well then. Well I've been not to come. Um your patch for the roof part, why isn't that possible in the order of work patch? Like how much do you actually do? Um so so out, out of the box, it's designed that you're going to build up a card of multiple products. Um, there's no leveraging this idea that I want to skip the card and just go straight to checkout. So my, my patch is... Um, I can't find it. Moment. <laughs> I could find it. Uh, I won't be able to find it. Um, sets a flag on the product to say that for this product, I want to skip the card and go straight to checkout. Um, I don't know. It, Boyan, the, the opinion is that it should be in court. He just hasn't got around to removing my patch. Quite clearly, it doesn't work. <laughs> Why can't you move all the steps out of the order workflow? Well, if you move all the steps, that's, so that, that's the checkout flow. That's nothing to do with the car. Um, the, the, the way that the model works is you add a product to your car, and then the car you take to the checkout, and the car is just a different order chain. Um, so what's um, it's a product I'm working on. <laughs> 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 I won't stake my reputation on that. It's no, isn't it? Bit of no. What would you call it? Offline payment methods or manual payment methods for like check, cash? Offline. Cash? Offline. Yeah. Offline. Yeah. Yeah. Offline payment methods. Um, uh, check, cash, 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 Yeah, all of these payment methods that require some sort of manual intervention set where... Uh, <laughs> 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 See what you did there? That's fair, like that. Um, yeah, all of these ones that require an offline intervention set um, <laughs> where you capture the, the payment method and you off it later. Um, and you can actually do that with, with Stripe. You can say, I, I just want to capture these details now and say, it's quite well for us actually for subscriptions. We want to say give them three days free and then later charge them. So if they cancel the subscription within the first three days, they get charged. And so you capture the 
the payment and then more for later. And that's done automatically with Stripe. And there's callbacks for it. But in the instance of a banker's draft or a check or whatever, you just go in to uh, edit the payment and then it's just completed. And one of the things that's actually quite nice out of the box, I can't demo it because I don't have a Stripe API key, um, is refund. Um, not only did it just take me six hours to implement the Stripe payment gateway, that also included full refund support and partial refund. No, not the <laughs> so we're, we're much more explicit in how we do things. Can you have a roadmap here? Uh, um, probably. So there's transitions nope. that happen. So like, let's say you need to reassign an order to a new customer. You click reassign to cart. And if you need to place an order, you click place. Or if it needs to be fulfilled, you click. You can Then you can hit cancel. So you know, in 1.x, there is a drop down status. Now it's much more explicit what you can do. And we've made certain items immutable. So it will show up in the sidebar as just like the customer info. You can't really edit it because it's just there. Um, or once an order is no longer in a draft state, you can't change it. You so can only transition it and like add payments. So that's using State Machine? Yeah, so State Machine, which... Um, I'll, try, I'll try and find the, the, the definition for it. So it's, it's, it needs some work. Like we just added logging, so like the, the order logging. Um, we have some default templates so that the edit and the view actually look the same as the sidebar. Um, it needs some more attention still. So, so, so in, in the code, it's, you're a lot more uh, restricted as to say, you can only go from this state if you're in this state or, or whatever. It's quite easy to configure in YAML. Um, I can't, can't find somewhere in there. Take some custom code. Here we can show it. I just have to code. Go to my the, the demo module and just show it real quick. It's one file. Well, you have to tag it as a service. Um, the internet's quite poor. I don't know if that would load. Yeah, it's a class, and um, it's called a checkout type resolver. <coughs> That's that come from? We'll come up with that. I feel like I'm just like talking to a pen. That's the thing that like um, <laughs> contact is actually needed to be there. If you code, we probably won't give a UI to it. Right. Um, so it's a tag service. So you go into your services that you have, and say, my class tag it as like checkout type resolver, um, and then give it a priority. This is what um, I do in my version. Someone said. Um, <laughs> So I did that in my version because we have a partner flow, we have a the normal flow, we have free trial, we have Shopify. Um, so we go through and in that resolver, it hands me the order. It says, tell me what checkout flow to fit in the return. You can do whatever you want. Like in A-B test, you can literally just be like, hey, PHP, give me a random number. If it's less than 10, put it in the B. If it's greater than, do A. Um, we use it, that's how I would do that um, in the last session we talked about what if you have digital and physical or mixed order, I would use that. I would say by default, yeah, I would look at the product and say like, okay, it's all digital, bam. Here, oh, it's a mix, right down the middle to that kind of time. And then just on the earlier point about uh, skipping the checkout or skipping the cart, um, I did write a config module for it. <coughs> just to have enabled it on that um, demo I did. Uh, add a event subscriber, and basically says if the bundle of the uh, order is checkout or X, skip the checkout, remove any extra quantity, just check out that one call. So it's valid as a contrib module, but it probably should be in core. I use it. I mean I have it implemented too, it's just need to we need a direct we need a direct to checkout button is what we need. Yeah, I built that. Yeah, but you need to put it in the checkout module. Nah, yeah. Detail. <laughs> Not out of the box, but should be doable. Um, you get an order history um, in your profile. So, Overmire has it. You just make a button um, that 
So I'll see if we can spit it out. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a reorder button for the B2B. We have an easy to do that. Or yeah, a duplicate, rather. It's a duplicate. Yeah. yeah, so I'll see if we can spit it out. Um, I don't know if we'll put it in core, because people yeah. might want to do a little <coughs> more, but it'll <coughs> either be a code recipe on the docs, or we can see if it's a control. Yeah, so um, in commerce crates, uh, pro uh, you have orders, you could add the button into that. I think we're almost at any. Uh, if you want to collect extra information when someone adds the product to the cart, so mm -hmm. either it's a t shirt or it's. Same, same, same principle thing. of uh, in Commerce One, of you can create a new pane <coughs> or create a field report, um, add a field to your. When you select an attribute, you're capturing information, and that's just a select list. You can have a text field if you want to capture a t shirt slogan, buy swiper. Do you mean like if you want to collect like like an engraving text? Do you mean like yeah, some cool. custom input here? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and that's what I'm doing right here. So I'm going to add a uh, a new field type to here. No, I want to make it even image because this is a bakery. And we're going to order a Drupalcon cake, and yeah. we want to upload a picture to put on the cake. I literally had to do this in 1.x. They want people to be able to send it. Let's be really careful when we demo the images. <laughs> <laughs> I won't upload. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so I've edited the order item type. Oh, here's a key difference. In 1.x, they were called line items. Now they're called order items because we made them more cohesive. Um, and we kind of normalized a lot of the, the terminology. I um, my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so what you need to do is you go to the manage form display, and then you would just take, oh, go to the add to cart. I always screw this part up. Um, and then go to picture. Wait, and why does it actually, why doesn't it say hidden? Did they change all the words? I don't know. I can't remember. So drag it up. Save it and then. Wait, what? Uh, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> Do you have a page open with it? Oh, here. I, no. Jesus Christ. I got it. You have the whiz history. No, I'm smart. See, I cleared so, <laughs> <laughs> so here, so now that field is there. So that's how you would take input. I see. So you mean like expanding that right there? Um, or like in, in this area, do you mean? Yeah, so I'm just trying to see how many in my thing where I'm like, oh, that's cool. Because I just read back to the thing and check my data is still there. So that's where, unfortunately, you have to duplicate. I always recommend duplicate the view so that way you don't override what shifts so you can get the updates. Yeah. Um, so then, so if you look at the order type, I'll just open a few. So that's so if you edit in here, there's a the cart settings. So cart form, I would duplicate the core one. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was like, it's, it's, it's all fields in that cart form, right? Yeah. And no matter what I did to it, it's still not showing up. Open an issue and we'll look at it. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so everything is customizable with the cart block, the, those cart forms. You can pick the view right here, um, and that's for each order type. So if you had a digital one, you could show like the like thing about I don't know, whatever you want. It does surprise me because then <coughs> trying to adopt the product is to share, so it just kind of flattens it down. I was like, okay, and then I don't share it. It seems to be like where the user when yeah. you the initial that's like key straight in. So it's on the I order. Think that's order. Why it's not doing it, but it's you can still kind of see it in the interface. We're out of time. Do you want to talk? Thanks, guys. All right. Woo! Okay. Thanks, guys.